This is a video made in addition to my proportional representation video, so if you've not seen that yet, I'd invite you to do so. If not, let me introduce you to eight political parties from a fictional country. The first is the Non-Existani Workers' Front, which is a sort of communist, or sort of neo-communist party on the very far left. Um, not a very popular party, but, you know, it still exists, like a lot of communist parties still do in Europe and a lot of other places in the world. Uh, the second is the Equality Party, which is a, a social democratic party. Quite a big party, as social democratic parties tend to be again in Europe. You can probably see that most of the um, sort of values that you see, or that you'll get to see in a minute when I go to the spreadsheet, are um, based on Europe. Then we've got the uh, PFTP, or the Party for the Planet, which is an environmentalist party. The um, PPL, which is a Liberal Democrat, sort of a centrist party that is progressive, but um, also economically liberal. And then there's the Pirate Party, very much a, a one-issue party. The Liberal Party, a classical Liberal Party on the right wing. There's the uh, the NCA, which is a confessionalist party on the right, um, as you know, you don't really get any more in the United States or Britain or a lot of other countries in the Anglosphere. But in Europe, you still get quite a number of confessionalist parties, um, most of them Christian democratic parties. And then there's the uh, National Identity and Restoration Movement, which is sort of a nationalist party on the far right, um, just so that we have a far left party and a far right party. So we have kind of got all the wings, the far left, the left, the center, the right and the far right. Right, so here we are in the spreadsheet that I uh, used in creating the proportional representation video. We've got our uh, eight parties over here with the wings that uh, they're on and the constituencies of the island on which the election, uh, the fictional election in that, uh, that video took place. Um, we've got the five constituencies and for each constituency we've got the numbers, uh, both in absolute numbers and in percentages of the votes cast for each party. Um, it was actually quite difficult to really get these numbers uh, in such a way that they were still proving my point about how proportional representation is more proportional than uh, first past the post, even with just five seats, which is really a very low number, um, but also not to go to the extremes, because it's very easy to engineer a situation in which first past the post starts looking really, really ridiculously uh, disproportional, when in reality things tend to be a little bit more nuanced. What you can see is uh, some geographical differences in uh, voter preferences, so the Equality Party and the Liberal Party are kind of popular throughout the country, um, or throughout the island, rather. Uh, but you can see that, for instance, the Communist Party, the NWF, still has some support in cities, particularly in the uh, constituency of New Bielefeld II, which is presumably, you know, an old factory district or something, where there's a lot of people who still very much feel they are a member of the proletariat. Um, but in the more rural districts, there's basically no supporters for them. And you can see the same with the Pirate Party. They've got some supporters in the city, but basically none in um, rural areas. The uh, National Identity Restoration Movement is the complete opposite, as again, you would see in reality, not that much um, support in cities, but in more rural areas, these far-right movements tend to get um, slightly more popular. Um, Right, if we look at the biggest party within each constituency, which is what matters for First Past the Post, you see that the Equality Party basically takes both uh, seats from Neil Bielefeld, the Liberal Party takes Leoness, and the NCA takes Avalon Vale and Atlantis Shore. Um, some of them are quite close, others are not. I mean, in Neil Bielefeld 1, for instance, um, the Equality Party is by far the biggest, because the next biggest party is the Liberal Party at um, 20%. In New Bielefeld 2, it starts to already get a lot closer, uh, with the PPL now at 23%, so that's you know still 13% off, but it's not you know as ridiculous as the 19% difference that there is between the largest and the second largest party in New Bielefeld 1. Um, and then in the more rural districts, it tends to get very 
uh, even between the larger parties. So the Liberal Party, for instance, in Lyonnais has 33% of the votes and the Equality Party has 32% of the votes. So that's very close indeed. It just happens to go to Liberal this time, but you can imagine in the next election it might go to Equality and then it might go back to Liberal and, you know, in a way that uh, seats, some seats, you know, swing seats, as, as they're known, tend to in uh, first-past-the-post systems. Apologies for the sound in the background. Um, the NCA gets the rural votes, which, you know, quite common really uh, for such parties. Although, again, you see that the Equality Party is very close on their heels, 1% uh, behind. And in Avalon Vale, actually, the Liberal Party uh, can also really keep up. And the National Identity Restoration Movement, get, movement gets uh, pretty close. Now, in the bottom of the screen, you can see that I've actually done this with 20 seats as well. 100 seats and then some other things and uh, for the first past the post um, results I've just extrapolated those as if you know when we're talking about 20 seats we're not talking about 20 constituencies but we're talking about five constituencies returning four members each and all of them would be from the largest party. It would be possible of course to simulate having 20 um, constituencies on the island but that would mean that would mean that I'd have to completely uh, you know, create a brand new table over here with all these percentages and all these numbers, which, you know, quite a lot of work. Um, and you can actually see in reality that uh, first past the post actually doesn't really change when you uh, change the scale. So the British Parliament, for instance, the House of Commons, 650 seats, enormous amount of seats, really disproportional, actually, if you look at um, what other uh, countries of a similar size have, that they often have far less than um, 650 seats. But those 650 seats are not that different from the only five seats that we see here. You know, two big parties and then some of the, the votes that go to another party. So I don't think that scaling up is necessarily an issue. But if you kind of want to make the argument that I've kind of cut um, FPTP short here by not simulating it with 20 constituencies and 100 constituencies, then, you know, fair enough. Um, now, proportional representation, of course, as I mentioned in the video, doesn't really care about constituencies. It's not that they don't exist. There are countries um, that have proportional representation do still retain constituencies, but these are often very large constituencies that may return like 10 or 20 members, um, so that you can still kind of get that proportionality. So let's uh, just say that, um, for instance, this island that we're looking at would not have this election for its own government, but it would just be one sort of multi-member proportional um, constituency in the entire country, then you would see that if it returned five seats, for instance, it would return them like this, two for equality, one for the PPL, one for the Liberal Party, and one for the NCA. Um, how do we arrive at that? Well, I kind of already went through that in the main video. You use this table, the De Holm table, um, and you basically just look at the total percentages, not at the percentages per constituency because those aren't important in PR. Um, so you just have these numbers you can see over there 10,674 is the same as over there um, and then in the second one is divided by two divided by three divided by four divided by five uh, as I kind of tried to explain at the end of the um, video and then you pick the five because in this case there are five seats you pick the five largest numbers and you apportion those seats so obviously 103,430 by far the biggest as you can also see over here I mean the equality party gets 33 percent of the total votes across the entire island which is quite a bit bigger than the next biggest party the liberal party at 20.4 percent um but you know you pick the biggest one and then the second biggest the third biggest the fourth biggest and the fifth biggest that's how you would um, end up with that. We've also got the fractional seats here. Now, fractional seats are... Uh, it's basically a matter of taking these percentages and translating them into seats. So if everything was purely uh, proportional, then the NWF would have 0.17 seats, which in reality would obviously involve cutting seats into bits and therefore also cutting people into bits. So it tends not to be a very popular <laughs> way of doing things. But, you know, it, it's a good... Um, thing to note down nonetheless because you can then compare the seats that parties actually get and the seats that they should get and you can kind of see you know if there are any rounding errors in there which uh, you'll actually see me do in the other tabs here as well now the more seats you have the more proportional PR gets is something that I mentioned in the main video and we can actually see it here um, over here 
if you look at this uh, graph over here, the seeds distribution, when there are only five seeds, it still doesn't really look very proportional at all. Uh, it's also represented over here in a, a linear graph, and over here at the bottom you can see what it should have been and what it actually is. So it's you know it's better than first past the post, but it's still not very good. If you now look at what it happens with 20 seeds, uh, this is the exact same uh, graph once again, but this time uh, we can see that the Party for the Planet and the National Identity Restoration Movement have actually got some seeds now. Um, and so it looks a lot closer to the fractional already. Um, this is actually, this 20 seed table is the one that I used for the 20 seed example that I used in the video as well. So the 5 seed and 20 seed, these first two tabs, this one and this one are the ones that I actually uh, used for that. Um, you can see that the table here works basically the same. You take the largest and then the second largest, this time uh, you go up to 20 rather than just up to 5. And then uh, you see over here the equality party gets 7 seeds. So that's still by far the largest. And you can see actually the fractional seeds, they should get 6.6 .6 and they get 7, so that's okay. Um, you also see that the NWF actually should get 0.68, but they don't get one seed. Whereas if you normally rounded that, you would round that up rather than down. So they would get one seed. Uh, and that's one of the things that the DeHolt method, which is what I'm using here, does. It uh, slightly benefits larger parties. Not by a lot, but it slightly benefits larger parties because of that, um, what I mentioned in the main video, the rounding error that you start getting into because you can't round everything up perfectly because then you might suddenly find that you need 21 seats in your 20 seat parliament. Um, so, you know, there's there's some uh, trouble there. There's some different ways of solving that. And over here with the Dehont method, you can see that actually some larger parties get benefited. Uh, or benefit from that rather a lot, whereas smaller parties uh, suffer slightly. With 100 seats, um, which I did actually run, I, I said in the uh, the video, in the voiceover, I said 100 seats, and then I made the, um, actually ran the numbers on it later, and kind of went, well, I can't really be asked to do 100 seats, until I then realized that actually you don't need to go up to 100, because you can just cut this table off at about 40, because the highest percentage uh, that any party gets is 33%. So it's unlikely that any party would actually go all the way to 100, let's be honest. So I cut it off at 40, and indeed the largest party, which is the Equality Party, as it should be, has 34 seats in this particular example. And over here you can really see how it benefits, uh, how De Hond, uh this method, benefits slightly larger parties because 32.98 should be rounded to 33, not 34 if you were just normally rounding it um, up or down. So that is the uh, the way that works. You can see again if we compare it to 20 seats over here. I've still got FPTP in there, but um, you can see that over here it's getting reasonably proportional with what it should be. Over here it is very close indeed. You know, there's almost no difference anymore. Every single party gets seats as well. Even the Pirate Party, which only has 5,987 votes, which is absolutely nothing, of course, compared to Equality's 103,000 but they still get one seat. Um, although again, you can see here with the home, they should really get 1.91. So normally you would round that up to two seats. Uh, in this case, it becomes one seat because of how this uh, table basically works. Now there is an alternative to the, the home method, which is the largest remainder method. And you can see that the table suddenly disappears here because this is a lot easier on the mathematics. What you basically do here is you take the fractional amount and the fractional seats that every party should get, um, which we already talked about, and then you round it down. You always round it down for every party. So even for, let's say, the Pirate Party, again, 1.91, you'd round that down to 1 here instead of up to 2. And then you have uh, a number of seats that you can already apportion to those parties. So you can already say, for instance, uh, the PPL is going to get 12 seats. Maybe they'll get more, maybe they'll... Well, no, actually, they won't <laughs> They won't lose any, but they'll get 12 seats. You know that already, and maybe they'll get another one. And then you uh, count all these up. You then find, oh, actually, those are 95 seats, and we have 100 to apportion. So there's five seats left that you can then apportion to the largest remainder. And I've done here some conditional formatting to show which five are the largest remainder, and those all get one extra seat. So you'll end up with this. And so you can actually see, or should be able to see, again, if you compare this graph over here to the one on the next one, you can see that the Party for the Planet and the Pirate Party get slightly larger. So you can again see how 
this method is fair, slightly fairer on smaller parties, whereas the Dehomme method slightly benefits um, larger parties. Now, I've also looked at some coalition possibilities because no single party, uh, even under uh, first past the post, gets an absolute majority. So there's going to have to be a coalition government on this island. What are the possibilities? Well, if it's FPTP, then it's, you know, there's two options really it's equality and liberal or the NCA and liberal. Um, if we look over here with our 100 seat uh, proportional representation, if we use the Dehont method, there are six possibilities. Um, two possibilities in which the largest party does not get to be in government, which I know is a bit odd if you're used to first past the post, but it can actually happen in proportional representation because the idea kind of behind proportional representation is that the governments that get formed don't necessarily represent the largest single movement, but rather they just uh, represent the majority. So if a majority can be made up of different minority parties, then that is technically fine. Although in pretty much every country that uses PR, there is some provision to make sure that the largest party gets sort of the first choice in, you know, which um, parties they would like to go into coalition with. And only if that doesn't work out, then uh, are the other options considered. So if here you see that, let's say we are at the head of the Equality Party with the largest party with 34 seats. We need 50, obviously, because it's a 100-seat parliament, so we need to at least be able to break even, and ideally we'd want 51 so that we can really pass legislation. Um, and fortunately, the four coalitions that are available to us uh, will actually get over 50, so it won't just break even, but will actually uh, go to 51, 52, 55, or 52 again. Um, and then, you know, you can look at, okay, fair enough, are those feasible? So equality plus the PPL plus the PFTP. It's a left-wing party and two centrist parties. Usually you'd say, yeah, you know, that's perfectly feasible. Um, equality plus liberal, that's, you know, a bit more difficult. They're two large parties from opposing sides of the spectrum, one uh, left-wing party and one right-wing party, but it can happen. In fact, in the Netherlands, where I live, um, our previous government not the current one but the previous government was composed of essentially the equivalent of this a large left-wing uh, social democratic party and a large right-wing liberal party so it can happen but it can make things a bit more difficult same thing is kind of true with the next one equality and the uh, nca and then finally there's one that's technically mathematically possible but probably not likely it's the equality party left wing again the ppl a very progressive centrist party and then the nirm a very very conservative even reactionary far right party so even if the equality party would want to go into coalition with the nirm the chances of the ppl wanting to do that are basically nil so you do end up in this case with um, some coalition possibilities that are mathematically feasible but in reality just wouldn't work out if we look at the largest remainder we actually see that that large um last one liberal nca pftp and irm which gets just 50 seats here that one actually ends up not being on the list anymore because that one goes under 50 seats and so wouldn't be a feasible uh, majority coalition anymore with the seat distribution in the um the largest remainder method now of course the problem that you can um, probably already see coming with this whole coalition stuff is that uh, the moment an election is over in a country with first past the post or a country with proportional representation but one party that gets an outright majority which is rare but can happen um, you immediately know okay that party is going to be the government and that party can then appoint ministers and basically take over the government from the next day whereas if you need coalitions you obviously need some time to kind of work out uh, which parties are going to work together and once you've worked that out you know which um, ministers or secretaries are going to be occupied uh, which of those positions are going to be occupied by which party which again take, can take a uh, really long time in the netherlands and in belgium uh, our southern neighbors we are very much uh, experts really at making those coalition talks incredibly long-winded and so I think the record is going to be more than 500 days. So that is definitely one uh, downside of um, of PR that, you know, I think I, I maybe should uh, should mention. There's also something that was actually pointed out by um, somebody who was commenting on my video. It's something that I already knew, of course, but I didn't really mention in the main video, is that in uh, situations where the election results throw up some coalition possibilities, like let's say this one which are mathematically possible but 
just not really feasible because of the large ideological differences, you might end up with a situation in which essentially nobody can form a coalition. And um, the comments in question pointed out that, you know, that has some relation to what happened with the Weimar Republic in the early 20th century in Germany. He also mentioned that some countries which have experienced this, including Germany, um, have actually gone on to introduce thresholds so that you need at least a certain amount um, a certain number of votes or a certain percentages of votes um, in order to be considered for seats in Parliament so that if you go back to our numbers, for instance, the Pirate Party, which would only get 1.9% of the votes, you might then say, no, OK, you don't get to be in Parliament, even if under 100 seats, you know, this method, you would get one seat and with the largest remainder, you would even get um, two seats. You don't get to be in Parliament because you only uh, represent such a small percentage of the electorate. And we set the threshold at 5%, say, you know, it's completely an arbitrary number, but a country might do that. That is a potential um, fix to to having really difficult coalition talks, although not personally 100% um, convinced that it works. Now, what I haven't really taken into account um, when looking at first past the post here is that... In reality, it probably wouldn't end up looking like this in the long term. Because of the spoiler effect that I already went into uh, in the video, what we would see is people who currently vote NWF, for instance, they would kind of go, OK, for enough, there's no chance that we'll ever get into Parliament, so instead we'll just vote equality. And uh, the PFTP might do the same thing, and then the Pirate Party might merge into the PPL, for instance. And so eventually you would end up with either just two parties, like in the effectively in the United States, or with, uh, as in Britain, two really big parties that basically control everything and then there are smaller parties but they don't really have anything to say. So the spoiler effect would actually really change these numbers um, and so I haven't really taken that into effect but in the end we'd probably here end up with a situation in which the Equality Party would basically suck up all the left, uh, the left wing and the far left and part of the centre and either the Liberal Party or the NCA would basically uh, suck up all the right into a l single large party that could then oppose the Equality Party. Because otherwise, if there are more parties on the right wing, they would just be hurting their chances against the left wing party and vice versa. So what we see over here would probably in reality actually uh, end up with these five seats, with two seats going to one party on the left or the right and three seats going to the other one. And then that probably swinging back and forth. Uh, between elections because that's what you actually see happening in a lot of countries that have first past the post uh, we can also actually look over here at um, a comparison between these different voting systems and exactly how proportional they are uh, this is slightly larger than the graphs we, we looked at earlier so this is a fractional one this is what it really should be if you want it to be um, perfectly proportional and you can really see that once you get to 100 seats in proportional representation it is basically that um, you know, regardless of which method you use, there are slight differences, like you can see over here with the Pirate Party, very noticeably. But, you know, we're talking uh, relatively small numbers there. 20 seats is already quite proportional, but you do see that two uh, smaller parties actually don't get seats. And then once you get just down to five seats, it gets really simplified. And once you go, once you go to first past the post, it actually shuts out even more parties. And out of these eight parties, only three of them actually get seats. And the NCA in particular ends up with, um, you know, a situation in which they should get 17.71% uh, of the seats and they actually get 40% of the seats. So it's that really doesn't make sense. But because they happen to win two constituencies, um, that's what it ends up like. So I know this is kind of something that I already went over earlier in, in this uh, little video but I did want to show that I had a sort of slightly larger more clear graph as well in which you can really see those differences. Now I made an addendum to my main video in which I talked about the um, United States and how it might benefit or not from adopting PR. Um, I added a lot of comments on that, well a few comments on that in which People kind of talked about what their preference would be. One of those was actually somebody who said they'd written um, to their representatives um, to advocate uh, adopting the alternative vote, which is not quite PR, but it's a, a related system. And um, how, of course, that hadn't happened, because as we all know, the United States still has first past the post voting. And I think you can really see in this graph why that's unlikely to happen 
because I mean over here with first pass suppose you've still got three parties but you know uh, in reality we'd have two parties let's just stick with these three parties if you are the representative of somebody who writes to you saying hey we'd like PR you are going to be of either the equality party the liberal party or the NCA and regardless of which of those three parties you're from you're likely to actually lose seats if you switch to PR it's not so bad for equality but if you're um, a member of the NCA for instance you can basically just go okay the number of seats we get will be halved uh, the moment we switch to PR so there's really no incentive whatsoever for big established parties in a first past the post system to switch to PR uh, even if their constituents might want them to they'd really be shooting themselves in the food which is why it's so difficult to do and countries that have done it have often done it through a referendum in which um, they should obviously completely shut out the established politics and just let the people have a vote um, then it can work uh, it's also interesting to see why it might not work the other way around because let's say you've got a PR system and you say you know I'd really like those uh, local representatives so we want to switch to first past the post that's also going to be really difficult because uh, let's just take this uh, the the whole method at 100 seats as an example yes you're going to retain the NCA the Liberal Party and the Equality Party so the majority of Parliament is possibly going to agree with it um, but there are still a lot of smaller parties that don't agree with it because they basically basically be completely shut out and if those parties can rouse up enough support among their electorate to basically campaign very vigorously against the adoption of FPTP you could still get a real media storm with uh, you know really negative news about first past the post and so it would still be very difficult to um, for the three parties that might actually benefit from it to change the system to first past the post without getting a significant amount of backlash from their voters so it is slightly easier um, in in real terms to change from PR to FPTP than the other way around but it's it's difficult either way and it it comes with a lot of friction and you can I think uh, in this graph kind of see why that might be and why certain vested interests have that vested interest in making things change or not making them change. I hope it was useful to get a bit more of an in-depth look at the numbers that make up different voting systems and for those who are worried that this channel has turned into one solely about politics, which it hasn't, I have got an exciting new history video coming up next, so until then.